following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! This, this is Radiohead. Broadcasting live on DallasCowboys.com and the official Dallas Cowboys app. Now your hosts, Tyler Klutz, Christy Scales, and Brad Sham. I'm Christy. He's Tyler. Brad has a scheduling conflict today, but uh, Tyler and I are glad to have you here, along with uh, Kyle Yeomans, our producer, and Tyler. Cowboys 6-4 and four come yeah. share uh, sole possession of first place in the NFC East after yesterday's 35-28 uh, to 28 win at Detroit. And before we take questions, Kyle has it teed up, but we want to share with everyone once again what we voted as our favorite moment from yesterday. There it is. What yep. do you think? The Those dance are, the, sensation sweeping the nation. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, oh, that, who did it better? Who did, did it was better? It, was it Zeke or was it Dak? The, so Dak was the previous week, and yeah. that's why he's wearing the salute to service. Yeah. But it obviously caught fire as a uh, meme that went viral. I don't yes. know. It's pretty close. It's pretty good. I mean, obviously Dak has uh, practiced and perfected this, uh, uh -huh. whereas Zeke kind of stepped in. Looked a little bit awkward, not as light on his feet, not as much hip movement, but uh, it's okay. It's a little rush, but I would say for, for imitation is the highest form of flattery, <laughs> right? And so he did He did do Dak justice, and uh, you know he got in his hip work, W-E-R-K, oh, look hip at you. work. Well, so it very was, well uh, done. It was, Kyle, it was great. who do you vote for, Dak or Zeke? Well, it's Dak, of course, because, I mean, okay. of course, he it's his dance, mm -hmm. and it's sweeping the nation, so yes. it's the Dak. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, I think Zeke did an admirable job. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. So, and, and the thing about Dak's performance is you can overlay uh, salsa music. <laughs> You can overlay all sorts of things. If if you haven't, you got to follow this guy Spice Adams. If okay. you do not follow him on Instagram or YouTube, but Anthony Adams, former D tackle, played for the Bears, played for the 49ers. I but, remember him. Yes. Oh yeah, and he is an absolute animal, a savage with social media and these videos that he creates. And he is probably one of the funniest human beings that I've ever met in my entire life. Okay. But he does a video on his Instagram with Dak and overlaid some music and oh, it was great. Uh, so. Well, I know the Cowboys cheerleaders are working on some social stuff to follow up. They, uh, speaking from our of, yeah, speaking of, okay, so you get to judge the cheerleading tryouts every year, which yeah, is yeah, for the televised on years. CMT, yes. which is now a huge, huge deal. So, uh, yeah, can we see it one more more time, yeah. Kyle. So give is us it a possible? play by play breakdown. Is it possible to take a look one more time and we'll use our analytical eye as a judge for D Okay. So this is similar to what the cheerleaders call sexy hips, which uh -huh. is towards the end of Thunderstruck <laughs> from the pregame. And sometimes we do get a little bit of the salsa or the Latin in the solo performances. My only concern with that and also with Zeke's, it's flexibility in the hips, but I wonder with the hamstrings because oh. it's the high kicks that is really the make or break when it comes to DCC. Oh. Now, see, I'm not sure about the high kicks on this with yeah, Zeke. And that he's a little bit shorter, too. Yeah, and that front foot, right? Yeah, the front it's foot. It's not planted it as, solid as, <laughs> as solid as Dak. See it float a little bit? I see it. There's a little bit of tightness, but again, admirable <laughs> effort, Zeke. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, Zeke uh, leads into our first question, and this is from Owen in Georgetown, and we know that uh, Zeke averaged just 2.8 yards per carry, yeah. and Dak 440 yards passing. 444. The, let's not forget Get the 44. 444. Yeah. 444 for number four. Have the Cowboys become a pass first team, Tyler? Uh, no, we have not. But I think for the first time this season, and really probably in recent years, where we're seeing our team, our offense, our play calling adapt to what is needed, as opposed to, okay, hey, this is what we're going to do. And if you stop us, we don't care. We are going to be who we are going to be. We built this offense, offensive line that can't be stopped. We're not the same, right? And so we're still built for the run. We have top three running back in the league. Regardless of what you're seeing right now, he is a top three running back in the league. And you've got a top five offensive line, right? I would say top three. I think there's question marks at left guard. And I know uh, Zach Martin is, is not healthy right now. Right. 
if if those two were top three, if those two Zach's healthy and you know we get some answers on that left guard position, we're top three. But we're still built to run the ball. But what's exciting to see is that Coach Garrett, Kellen, uh, John Kitna are adapting like, and Coach Garrett said uh, to Pam Oliver, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, if they're going to load the box and stop the run that uh, Patricio had said that we're not going to, we're not going to let Zeke beat us like he did last year. Okay. We're going to actually take what you give us as opposed to, we're just going to do what we practiced all week and we're going to run it down your throat and run it down your throat and prove the point. They actually adapted like the previous week when Dak was throwing it all over the place, Minnesota couldn't stop us, but we kept running the ball. We kept running the ball for one yard here, two yards here, minus one here, three there. It was really hard. It was an uphill battle. Detroit was trying to do the same. They're trying to say, you're not going to run the ball on us, but hey, we're going to go ahead and leave some space in the secondary for you to pick us yeah. apart. And we took advantage and we stuck with it. Yeah. And that's the thing, just the threat of Zeke, because mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Patricia has to do that. And uh, Amari Cooper... Boy, he played his heart out, mm-hmm. and there were several times in yesterday's game where he'd take himself out, uh, you know, after running a, a couple of routes or so, after making a catch, he'd come over to the sideline. But one of the reasons why uh, Gallup and Randall Cobb in particular were having such big days yeah. is Patricia had committed Darius Slay, who's their top corner and way above mm-hmm. anybody else in their secondary. He, Slay followed Amari around, yeah. and so trying to match him up and lesser guys against Gallup and right. and Cobb so just a threat there and that's and that's a good point right you talk about the value that someone brings to a game you know we talk about Tyrone Crawford didn't have the numbers that DeMarcus had or some other defensive you know defensive lineman interior exterior it doesn't matter but the presence that he demanded and the and dirty work the he did tangibles yes. that he brought to Absolutely. the team it's the same reason with Zeke Zeke is not 800 yards that's that's no slouch like that's a great that's a great number to have at this point in the season i mean he's on pace to be over 1200 yards you're telling me a running back in the nfl is not okay with 1200 yards exactly like, that's great but the presence <laughs> he's, he's kind of set the standard that's high what for i'm himself. saying right like everyone's all oh, zeke's not zeke's not who he used to be he's not explosive he's not this Guys, like, let's take a look at where he's at right now. But the presence and the um, the game planning, you know that those defensive coordinators have that red jersey on Zeke's position mm-hmm. every single week. We have to stop Zeke. We have to stop Zeke, which is very, very good for Dak, which is very good. So because now, okay, Michael Gallup and Randall Cobb, who are two and three receivers, now they are a very, very effective weapon for us, but they just do can't they they don't demand the attention that the other ones do and now that leaves windows for them to take advantage of it and and so I, I think that that's that's one thing to notice and Amari is the same thing he's hurt right now but having him dressed and having him out there has more of an impact than people yeah. give credit and, for. And, and these plays that we're seeing here, you'll notice on those last two, those were play actions, and this was a play action to Pollard here. Mm-hmm. And you know, again, you're having to make the defense respect that run, and yeah. just that, just that half a second of hesitation made all the difference. You'll see how much uh, time Dak had to throw yesterday. Yeah. As much over the last two weeks in particular that the offensive line has struggled in opening yeah. holes for Zeke. The pass protection has been yes. fantastic. Yes. And we want to mention something mention something about Tony Pollard here. That was just such an outstanding uh, run after the catch there. But I was really excited the way that uh, he got more snaps yesterday. Tony Pollard ended up with 13 snaps on offense, so yeah. 13 out of 74 total plays by the offense. That shows you how much the Cowboys were able to uh, keep command of the game. You usually get about 65 plays. Uh-huh. each side of the ball per game. So 74 plays for the Cowboys offense yesterday. Pollard was on the field for 13 of those. Now Zeke was on the field 66 out of 74, so 89%. Uh, but there were several plays yesterday. I think the previous week we only saw at one time where Pollard and Zeke were on the I'll field the together. Did you like seeing them yes. on the field together more yesterday? I think we said this a couple weeks ago. We talked about that threat, right? Mm-hmm. Because, okay, Pollard obviously is a little bit more dynamic, a little maybe call it fresher legs. I don't mm-hmm. know, but a little more explosive at this point right now. So they've got to they've got to respect that and they've got to account for that. So whether he runs a fly sweep 
whether he runs a secondary option, whether he runs a pass route. They've got to account for the weapon that he is. So now, as a defense, you're like, okay, we can only we can only honor so much in the box because they have this other weapon, which we're proving over and over that he is a weapon. We've got to honor that outside of the box mm-hmm. or both in the box, but now who are we keen? What, exactly. what are we putting our mic on Zeke? Or are we putting them on Pollard? How are we doing that? So it's just a lot more process that the defense has to go to to account for all of those in that personnel, as opposed to. And again, it's so funny when I was a player, right? I was I was an adamant adamant advocate for the fullback, and and it's just a different mentality. There's times that you have to have a fullback, and you have to be able to go hit him in the mouth, and you have to create that uh, that present that mentality, but. The, the accounting that the defense has to do with two explosive backs in the game is very different. Very different. And so that's big for me to say, by the way, just because I'm yeah, all Yeah, because it the goes fullbacks. against the, the, your core. Everything that I am. <laughs> everything that I am. But, and that is something that, that I would like to see more of. I heard a stat this morning that um, we are, we are 6-0 and when Tony has uh, double-digit play counts. And we're 0-4 and when he has less than 10 plays. And not that that translates, but these games are so close, right? These games are, are come down to inches. And so those four to six plays that he's in that could make a big impact on the play, I think that we need to continue on that yeah. on that progress. And speaking of it coming down to inches and Tony Pollard, what I really loved about yesterday, we saw that sweep and the great run and mm-hmm. him scoring. But on that two-point conversion mm-hmm. where he barely got it in fought for the two-point conversion, yep. he fought for all of it. But that was a, up the, that was a tough run. Yep. And I think that people – thought of him as a rookie coming out of Memphis, and I did not see him play at Memphis. I'm going on what I heard from scouts, and then mm-hmm. other, I mean, it's like, oh, this guy is a great return guy. He actually had more uh, uh, receptions and receiving yards than he had rushing yards at Memphis. Wow. So, yes, uh-huh. he was really uh-huh. more of a rece- receiver I, as a mm-hmm. running back, but receiving back than yeah. a runner yeah. at Memphis. But I really loved that toughness that he showed up there. Yeah. Well, and I also kind of want to mm-hmm. add to this a little mm-hmm. bit, but one of the biggest things about Tony Pollard coming out of college was the fact that uh, he wasn't the same type of runner as Ezekiel Elliott, or that was one exactly. of the storylines, that they're different runners. It showed yesterday during that two-point conversion that he can run tough just like Zeke can, but mm-hmm. he can also kind of hit the holes a little bit better with a little bit more speed. That's and, right. And now if we can just get him popped on a, a return or two. You know, yeah. we haven't seen that yet. Yeah. And uh, there was that one kind of flub early in the game where it went in. That was more of a miscommunication, yeah. I think, kind of thing with the – uh, blocker. Anyway, he got so close. I'm glad that he decided to come if, out because I think his toe was right on the edge and yeah. or, or right in the that field of play. That could have been really bad. Oh, really, really, bad. really fast. May, may we talk special teams? Yeah. Because it has been average at, at best. best. Yeah. And when we're playing all of these close games, especially the ones mm-hmm. coming up, and when you're playing a team like the Patriots that in general don't beat themselves, mm-hmm. when you have very evenly matched teams, you need to win two out of three phases of the game. Right. So whether it's offense or defense, that other one it, in all likelihood is going to be special teams. And I just haven't seen that this year for the yeah. Cowboys. They've, I think they've been even. Yeah. In a few of the games, but I don't think it's going to cut it the rest of the way. No, no. And, you know, one thing that, that I have seen a little bit more of a shift is that uh, we have less starters on special teams lately, right? Jeff Heath is the mainstay, right? He's playing every play on defense, but then he plays on, on special teams. He's been out, obviously. He was out this last week. Um, that, that's, a, that's a whole. But as a whole, the entire year, we – we don't have the returns, we don't have the pressure, yeah. and we have a lot of mental errors. Like those are things, those are areas that you can control the mental errors. You know, the returns, with the way special teams is situated now, you don't have as many opportunities to return balls. Kickoffs are few and far between. It seems like we've seen a lot lately of short yes. kicks. Yes. Um, but the the mental errors, those are things that we have we have to correct. And you know, Keith O'Quinn, I, I love him and I think he's a great coach. Um, you know, he, he spent a lot of time under Rich Passaccia, who's who's an amazing, amazing special teams coach. 
Um, I just I don't know if the communication is clear between the the entire staff because the entire staff has input on special teams, mm-hmm. but then between Coach Garrett, Keith O'Quinn, and then the team. So somewhere in there, there's a communication breakdown on a lot of these key plays. And so we just we've got to improve that aspect of the team because we need a big return. We just haven't we haven't seen a ton of those. Yeah, we had some flukes where we okay, hey Pollard got out to the thirty five and like that's great mm-hmm. and that and that shifts the field position a little bit. But we need a game changer. We right. need a punt return for a TD or we need a block punt or we need to pin. And one thing I'll say too is is Chris, who is I and I think a top two or three punter in the league. He has not been able to pin him back inside the five like no, he normally he, he does. He's so great. I mean, he has been a weapon in yes. terms of flipping the field. Yes. And I just haven't seen that from him this yeah. year. Well, you know, uh, I think that we have, in terms of coverage, I think overall the coverage has been coverage good. Coverage has been Co- okay. Coverage is sol- pretty, pretty returns, solid. A couple bigger turns. A couple bigger turns. A couple big but... returns. Now, losing Kayvon Frazier. Yeah, big. And now, Kayvon, two years ago, I would have argued that Pro he Bowl. should have been in consideration yep. for the Pro Bowl. I mean, Matt. Matthew Slater gets it every year, AFC, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But Kayvon Frazier and Chris Jones were weapons yeah. in 2017. Um, Frazier, of course, went out with the injury early this year. C.J. Goodwin, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he is one of – and this isn't me saying with all of my expertise of coaching special teams. This is me talking – uh, with Jeff Heath, with Keith O'Quinn, with Philip Tanner, with Carlos Polk, mm-hmm. um, they'll tell you that he's uh, among the best in the league. Yeah. And then you have a young guy like Vintel Bryant, who is a backup wide receiver, but is on the 53-man roster because of his coverage ability. He basically has taken over for Kayvon Frazier. But, uh, you know, but, but back to so the coverage, I think, has been been pretty good overall. You mentioned a couple oh. of breakdowns, yeah. uh, but with the returns, you know, I think one one reason why our numbers are so gaudy on offense, the Cowboys, mm-hmm. when you're having to go 80, 85 <laughs> yeah. yards, the field position has been yes. overall terrible. Yes, yeah, I I agree, and it's it's hard to sustain that as an offense, right? And there's a momentum aspect, there's a physical aspect that 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 bad f- field position plays uh, into an offense's production, but. We've been really good coming out of our end zone, but that's not where you want your offense to be. Right. You've got to be able to get out and you've got to put them on a short field because think about how effective we are coming out of our end zone and we can actually give ourselves some breathing room, whether we're punting it and turning it back over, but changing the field position. But imagine if we got the ball on the 45. Oh, Imagine yeah. if we yeah. got the ball on the other side of our 50 because we mm-hmm. back them up and then we, you know, they get a good punt, but we return it to the 50 yard line. Those are things that really do make a difference. And you talk about winning two of the three phases. I mean, it's like a 85% stat that's always true. If you win two, two of the phases Just in that game, that, that you mm-hmm. win the game. And so we have not defensively, we've talked about it every week, right? We are not where we were last year and we're not where we thought we were the first three weeks of the season. And so we're not winning defense. And then, you know, we look at special teams and that's the intangible. And we're getting away with it. We're getting away with wins without winning two of the three phases. So, I mean, kudos to the offense. And I don't want to just say, hey, our offense, we don't have any flaws and we don't have things that we need to work on and get better at. Um, And that defense is horrible, but we do need to offset that with special teams and special teams does need to pick up. Well, what happened uh, yesterday, the great thing about having an early game yeah. and about being on the team charter, uh, American Airlines does yeah. the charters. And so with the new fancy planes that were on, uh, we were actually able, by the time we were taken off, I think everybody on the plane mm-hmm. was the Cowboy team charter was watching yeah. the Eagles yes. and the uh, Patriots. And the pa- thank you, Patriots, yeah, for the for win over on. the Eagles. <laughs> yeah, for holding on. But I thought, again, I only saw the second half. But that game, if anybody gets a chance to watch it on NFL Game Pass or if you recorded it, whatever, that yesterday was indicative of the importance of special teams mm-hmm. because the – Patriots offense is struggling, mm-hmm. but they pinned the poor, the Eagles so deep. The Patriots won that game because of their special teams. Yeah. And the Eagles, uh, the Patriots have good defense. Eagles were not 
great on offense yesterday, and they had so far to travel yeah. that that was really a difference. That leads to a second question, and this is from Sandra in Wiley, who was watching the, I think she must have been watching the Patriots game, because she said that Tony Romo says Bill Belichick has the reputation of identifying a strength of the opposing yep. offense and taking it away. Yep. What do you think Belichick will commit to taking away uh, in this Sunday's game against the Cowboys? That's a great question. I mean, that's well thought out. Is Yeah. Is it going to be like Matt Patricia and take the Zeke away, or do you take Amari away? Or No, I that's think— gonna be, That's going to be—it is an interesting I question. I think with what the trend we've seen the last six weeks is who is the biggest weapon? Dak is the biggest weapon. Right, you know, you can gamble on. Okay, is Amari going to be healthy? Is he going to be able to finish the game? I, I don't know. But what I do know about Belichick is that he is going going to identify what your strength is, and he is going to take that away. And so, what is it? What is our biggest strength? Dak, right now, he is he is the reason this offense is doing what it is. Yes, we've got great tools. We got Gallup who stepped up. We got Randall Cobb who stepped up. Uh, we got Jarwin and and Wit. Those guys are are doing exactly what they need to do. Obviously, Amari, when he's healthy, is unstoppable. But Dak is at the center of all of that. So, got to take him away. Got to take him away. And so, how, how do you have, do that? So, you have to pressure him. Okay. So, I uh, watch watch for a lot of interior twists. And so he's going to use the D-line and linebackers to pressure Dak. And he's going to challenge Zeke, and he's going to keep him in to pass protect, can't get, let him out. And you're going to see a lot of games because we've shown that we've struggled to pick up games at times this year. So how are we going to? How is he going to blitz and move the defensive line to get into Dak's face? Because the, like you said, the last couple of weeks he's been upright. He's been able to you know step in the pocket. He's been able to throw the ball well. How do you how do you get into his face and how do you do what Green Bay did to us? How are you putting him on the turf on every play? Because that's how you neutralize Dak. And so because we talked about we talked about it earlier with Brad a couple weeks ago, is you take your eyes off the receiver for a split second, the play's gone. I yeah. mean, it, it, this game that, happens too fast. Yeah, lowering your eyes, that's I think exactly. is what so it's called. If you can get his eyes off of target, then he has a harder time being effective. Mm -hmm. Now he has not used his legs much the last couple of weeks. That is one thing that hasn't had to. Hasn't had to. And so, as an offense, okay, what do you anticipate? I anticipate Belichick bringing pressure and challenging us all the time. Because if if Amari is out, okay, we can probably take our secondary and we can great defense in, in New England, right? We can take our secondary and we think that we can cover Randall and we think that we can cover Gallup. Those are two guys that we think that we can neutralize one on one. So we're going to use those extra bodies to pressure. But now I'm I'm uh, Kellen Moore is how do I get Dak out of the pocket, moving, get him comfortable, take the pressure off of his face, let everything develop in front of him, and let him then be effective that way because we've seen him throw really really well on the run. So and you think we'll see some waggles I think, and boots? I think we've and... got to get him out of the pocket because I think mm -hmm. the pressure's coming. I, see. I think that's something that we have to anticipate because that's how he's that's how he's going to stop us. And you know he's going to keep and and that's and that's twofold, right? Is on the run game as well, right? If you have that extra body and we and we go one on one on the the exterior, assuming Amari is not healthy or not not all the way there, is now we've got eight guys that we can do whatever we need to do with in the box to pressure pressure Dak and stop Zeke. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is uh, more injury concerns with the Cowboys O line. Uh, yeah. Lyle Collins, who had. Uh, uh, sprained his uh, MCL in his mm -hmm. left knee a few weeks ago. He aggravated that yesterday and wasn't able to finish the game. So Cam Fleming came in. What a luxury to have a yeah. guy who won a Super Bowl as the starting tackle so, for the so Patriots. So another another <laughs> scary thought uh -huh. for uh -oh. <laughs> another scary thought for the the genius that is Belichick is that. He knows all of Fleming's weaknesses. He, he, exactly. Does he? I mean, he's like, okay, I know that he struggles on inside pass rushes. I know that that's not, and I don't know. I'm just making it up. Um, or is it? Hey, we're gonna we're gonna press up field, and then we're gonna spin underneath, and then we're gonna wrap our interior D lineman outside for contain to keep that contained. I mean, there's so many things that like he can do and see and anticipate. So that's one thing that I don't think falls into our flit, our favor is having Cam Fleming out there. Not that it, he's it, a very it, capable, it, yeah. very good. Tackle. Like, we're so lucky that we do have him, but who knows him better? Yeah. 
And then, of course, Connor Williams will be out again uh, mm-hmm. this week. We anticipate that he'll uh, be out. You see uh, Fleming there at yeah. uh, one of the practices. So, yeah, won a Super Bowl uh, and uh, aerospace but here's, guy. Here's by one, the way. you know, yeah. one bright spot that we didn't really talk a ton about, and and the. The TV copy didn't talk a, a ton about, but Suafila, how he filled in at left guard, right? Really a very well, right? serviceable yeah. mm-hmm. job mm-hmm. in the, at that side where yeah. we weren't calling out, oh my gosh, we got a hole there, we got a hole there. But now you've got two guys that don't have as many snaps or the chemistry, you know, with Zach, Travis, and Tyron, you know, and, that and, now have to fill in to a very, very hard defense to face. And when you mention the games mm-hmm. that Belichick and the defensive front will do, you're talking, you know, some stunts and basically. Basically, it's trick plays by yeah. the defense. To yeah. it, it, and the main thing with that, and correct me if I'm wrong, from an offensive line standpoint, is communication. That's it. And so, uh, you know, Suafilo started eight games last yeah. year, but that was not with Travis Frederick. That yeah. was with Joe Looney. Yeah. So he's only played one full game plus, yeah. I think, about 13 snaps from back in week one alongside Travis Frederick. Yeah. But Suafilo. You know, serviceable more than that, really. Yeah. A, a starter with the Texans. Yeah, two and so luxury I feel things that we absolutely. have is, is both of those. Because most know, of the time, you're six and seven on the offensive line. That's abs- not. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, there's been times where one of the five goes down, and you're like, season's over. We can't. <laughs> we can't function if we don't have our starting five, and we can't function. Yeah. So. Uh, I have a question for you, yeah. and that is, since we're uh, going to get a chance to go to New England and see the Patriots. The Cowboys get to go to New England only once every eight years. Yep. And so I have been, I've had this circled on my calendar, just yeah. the chance to see Tom Brady and Bill Belichick yep. in their home environment. But what is uh, Coach Belichick's reputation within the NFL player community? Uh, I mean, highly respected. Um, you know, there's not the... There's not the public perception that you see from a lot of fans. Oh, he's a cheater, or he's this, or he's that. Like, there is just, okay, look, he wins. Like, what matters in our business, right? It matters if we win or we lose. And he consistently wins. Doesn't matter. He's got one mainstay on that team, right? He's got Tom Brady. And that's it, right? And you can maybe argue Gutskowski. Like, maybe, right? Like, that's the only other thing that you can say. But he's cycled guys through, and he continues to win, and he continues to win. And every time that you play them, Every time you step on the field, it's always different than what you prepare for. So it's one of those things that it's like, all right, like we know that we're not going to be able to prepare completely for what we're going to see. We can, you know, some of it may carry over, some of it may not, but we know physically we have to execute our game plan better than we've ever executed. So there is that heightened awareness, that is that heightened alertness whenever you play a Belichick team or the Patriots. Um, And in New England, that's tough too, right? It is, it is a tough place. It's, probably going to be cold. I haven't looked at the weather, but yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to kick off at four 30 Eastern time. And the high that day is like 40 or 41, Yeah, so it's gonna but, be but it, it turns dark at four 30 up yeah. there. So yeah, it's, gonna it, it's probably going to be in the mid thirties. I yeah. think yeah. the main thing is if there's not a lot of winds. Yeah. And oh. hopefully it stays dry. Cause yeah. I've, yeah. I've played a cold, wet game, which is not a cold snowy game. I played a cold, wet game there. So much worse than oh, snow, so awful, much worse than awful. snow, but the reputation for Belichick, I mean, there's really nothing but respect. You can't say you can't say anything else. Um, the guys that that play for him, you kind of hear that he's not really a player's coach, even though they may not like him and he may be kind of a hard a. Like he, they still respect him. And he's, I would think, and consistent. You consistent. probably know exactly where you That's stand. That's exactly right. <laughs> and there's, and, and and from a player's perspective, there's nothing that you respect more than okay, I am who I say I am. Because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of acting. Right in this in this in this business, right? The more brands grow, the more social media grows. There's a lot of like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be louder than I am effective, and there's a lot of that. And so he is quiet, and he just does his job. Yeah. And so and you know he's he's a very smart brain. Coach Garrett is too. You know he gets he gets knocked he's a lot. He's very consistent. He is very consistent, right? And he gets knocked a lot for stubbornness. Like stubbornness doesn't necessarily translate to to being a bad thing. Like. He is stubborn because he knows who we are. He knows what we do. Now, there's some things that I th- I think that he's grown in in the last couple of years. Uh, Coach Garrett, I'm talking about, uh, but very similar minds, right? He's Coach Garrett is one of the smartest people that I've been around, and I've been around a lot of smart people. Okay, I've been outside the locker room too, guys. Before <laughs> before you judge me, like, well, he hasn't been around very many smart people, um, but he, he's got a great mind, and and he can put together something. 
And I think the maturity that he's having as a head coach, you know, what, you're 10? Yes, yeah. this is his 10th year. Yeah, you're 10. I mean, you're starting to see that. And, you know, hopefully we can come out of Foxborough uh, where he can, you know, top Belichick. Well, you say you've seen him grown in a couple of ways yeah. over there. Yeah. What's an example? So I think that he, so he's always been a player's coach. Coach Garrett has. He's always been a guy that backs his guys. He's never going to throw anybody under the bus. He's never. Gonna, but one of the things that I wish that I'd always seen from him is sometimes just call it like it is. Like, don't have the the PC answer. Like, okay, sometimes like we need some like accountability and not that he didn't hold guys accountable because he always held the team accountable but sometimes I would just like to see like that rage I would love to see some emotion right and I you're think, talking about with the public uh, or, or do you mean you mean both, inside the both, team meeting room? right so so he's very transparent he's very unfiltered in the team meeting room as everyone saw <laughs> that's on the a great Amazon, way to put it yeah right and, and, if, and if you don't have Amazon <laughs> Prime to see that you go it look is it definitely up. worth yeah. it it is just it pay is. for the month binge watch it and then you can you and, know save and, the he's, money. and he's very very much that but yes to the public but I've also seen him adjust and I've also seen him um, realize that okay we have this system we have this team built the way that we do we we don't have to be one dimensional you know, and understanding too that like he's very prepared and like we have to go through every single situation and we have to know, okay, in with six seconds left, we're on the fifty yard line, what three options do we have here? And we're gonna run through those. Like being able to say, Okay, look, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna let these athletes be athletes and I'm gonna take advantage of what we're great at. One thing that I've learned in my transition out of football is that in football I tried to be everybody else and I tried to be a you know, a fourth Jason Witten. I tried to be a, you know, starting Daryl Moose Johnson. I tried to be this Matt Slater on special teams. Obviously, I'm not a Matt Slater on special teams. But, you know, I tried to be all these things. And I tried to be something, instead of realizing, okay, what was I made to do? And how can I be best at that? And I think Coach Garrett, a lot of times, is like, the more you can do, the more you can do, the more you can do. And now he's realizing, okay, we got to do what we're best at, and we got to be who we are right now, as opposed to who we built this team to be four years ago. Okay, which is why you play to the hand that's hot that's with right. Dak, like like yesterday. That's right. Well, I can't wait to Dak and Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. First time I got to see Tom Brady live, it, it was a. 2003 at yeah. oh, in wow. New England. This is how long ago it was, and this is how long Tom Brady's been around. Uh, anybody want to take a guess? Kyle, jump in. Those of you watching, put on your thinking caps. Who would have been the Cowboys' starting quarterback in 2003? It was Quincy Carter. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> it was Quincy. Okay. It I was Quincy. That right. You would have yeah, gotten it right. No, oh, sure. Yeah. All of you watching and listening so, would have. But I have to tell you my – oh, go ahead. I would say, was Vinny T here yet? No, no, no. Okay. That was the next year. Next year, okay. yeah. Okay, because Bledsoe was, the was still there. No, uh, but because uh, no, 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 no. Because Bill, Bill took uh, the Cowboys to the playoffs with Quincy in two thousand three, yes. and then Vinny, then I believe was next. the next year. Okay, okay. And then Drew Bledsoe uh, after that, and yeah. uh, Tony Romo took over for Bledsoe in the middle of two thousand six. Right. But but I'd like to share, and Kyle will like this too. Uh, but people will ask, oh, sideline reporter. 21 years, I don't want to date myself, but what are some of the funniest things that you've ever seen or craziest things that you've seen on the field? And it was actually my first year on the sideline, 1999, and it was preseason. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a preseason game at the Patriots. And back then, I can't remember if it was the first or second game of the preseason, but the starters did one or two series and then they were done. So it's late first quarter, and I'm kind of over on the left side of the bench, and Troy and Michael and Emmett and Novacek, all those guys have been done for a little while now. And Michael is kind of standing next to me, and he has a, his arm around a boy, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years old. And I know it's not Michael's son. It's this blonde-headed, blue-eyed kid. And, then, and I'm like, what's going on? Why is this kid down here? And just about then, uh, Michael looks back towards the, the stands and a man is walking down the steps towards his front row seats, holding a uh, one of those paper trays stacked with hot dogs. Mm. And he gets to near his seat on the front row and Michael sees him and turns and he takes the kid back and lifts the kid back into the stands and takes the uh, tray of hot dogs from the man and Michael and Emmett 
Sat down and ate hot dogs. Well, they didn't sat. They (laughs) stood there, and the rest of the game, I'm dodging little uh, ketchup and mustard packs there on the edge of the bench. the dad traded his kid and said, okay, you watch my kid, and I'll go get you hot dogs. Yes. So Michael Irvin (laughs) babysat in the middle of a preseason game. Yes. Yes, That's amazing. I'm telling you it happened, and, and of course it's my first year on the sideline. I had been the booth producer yeah. up in the booth with Brad Sham and Babe mm-hmm. Laufenberger before that. Brad Sham and Dale Hansen, and so you know, I thought, oh man, I've seen it all in the NFL. It's my second or third game on the sideline. It's like what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll hilarious. always remember that I, when I think of going to New England, I think of Hot dodging dog do, dodging uh, mustard packets Love on the it. sideline. Okay, so you talk about '90s Cowboys. Who do we have oh, next to us here? Well, well, this is uh, the the America's Team Collection. Thank you, Ian King and Dallas Cowboys Merchandising. This came out today. So this is a public service announcement for those of you who need to get some Christmas shopping done, like me. Uh, so I've I've already when Roger Staubach came out earlier this year, that kind of took care of the uncles mm-hmm. and my dad. So this took care of like my cousins. Say so cousins, I ordered brother, that for yep. today. Yep. So Troy Aikman, uh, if you're not familiar with the America's Team collection, it's something that is really cool. Yeah. The Dallas Cowboys merchandising is doing this year every Monday of the regular season. It's a different player, and it's great because they've mixed classic Cowboys, Cowboys of the 90s, current Cowboys. So every Monday it's someone new. So Troy is this week, and I'm and one of the the reason why they decided to have Troy uh, today it, for this Monday is because. Um, He's going to be announcing the game in New England, of yeah. course, with Joe Buck and Aaron Andrews. Well, for Thanksgiving, when Buffalo comes to town, it will be, and Kyle, if we'll go back to this shot here. Boom. Tony Romo, yeah. So if you get, yay, all yeah. right. So we've got, we've got two quarterbacks back-to-back, which I think is kind of unfair. So nieces and nephews for that one for yes. Christmas gifts, right? A- actually, okay. that's exactly right. Yeah, there we go. You can't uh, but, give that away. It's too early. <laughs> well... I know I shouldn't. You know but, they're all watching. So. Okay, they are watching. Now, okay, I'll give this away, too, since you work with him. But yeah. I, I have asked for two, okay? Yeah. I, w- I begged for two T-shirts for myself, not to buy for others for Christmas or just as gifts. But um, I have my uh, Drew Pearson because that was last month. But coming up next month is uh, your co-worker, Darren De-A-Ron? Woodson. De-A- Darren Woodson. Day De-A- Aaron. Yeah, so. Who will uh, be by the studio here shortly. Oh, He'll see? He'll be down here. He'll be down really? here a little bit later. He's coming yep. down a little later. We should have invited him oh, early know, to join I us. Know. Hey, we're almost out of time, but I want to talk about something special that mm-hmm. the Cowboys are doing tomorrow. <laughs> and it's a tradition uh, that takes place about a week and a half before Thanksgiving, every November. And it is when the Cowboys and the cheerleaders in the Dallas Cowboys Women's Association serve the early Thanksgiving dinner. And it's uh, usually on a Tuesday because that's the players' day off, but yep. the players don't have tomorrow off because they're volunteering their time. So at the Car P. Collins Salvation Center in Dallas, Mm -hmm. you have the Cowboys veteran players and the Dallas Cowboys Women's Association. And in Fort Worth at the Maybe Social Services Center, that's where the Dallas Cowboys Rookie Club will be with the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleader Rookies. But I know this is something that Mm -hmm. you've done in the past. What do you remember about those events? Uh, It's one of the more special days of the season. Um, You know, there's a couple things we do. We do hospital visits and, um, you know, I got to do three years of that but the the thanksgiving uh meal distribution that we do for the group uh it really is so special because for the first time we get our families invited as well so my wife and my oldest was able to do the last year because she was old enough to actually like carry a tray and, and go serve it but being able to to serve those that maybe this time of thanksgiving have less to be thank- thankful about and and maybe you're just in need of some love and some help and uh, it's really fun to see you know the guys take their helmets off and put their servant hat on mm-hmm. and it's really cool and and it's really a good time of perspective right for these guys to say oh hey all I'm worried about um, is making sure that you know I'm running my stop route at at 11 yards and not 10 yards and like I'm getting ripped because you know I'm the left guard on punt team and I forgot to pick up that that twist right there and like it seems like it's the end of the world when you make those mistakes when you go and you do this and you see these families and you see these parents that that are really facing a hard time and they don't even know where their next meal is coming from 
And so being able to go in and serve and have conversations with those people, it really does give you a refreshed per, uh, perspective on, okay, what really is important? Not that what we do isn't important to demand my attention and, and all of everything that I am, but it also just gives you perspective to allow you to go do that freely and saying, okay, this is a gift and I'm, I'm going to be out here doing this because, because this was an incredible gift that I'm allowed to do and I'm just going to go do it to my fullest because it's not always going to be here and I could be somewhere else. So be grateful and be thankful that I'm in this position. And this day uh, is just that. And then the opportunity that they give you to do it alongside your family. I know the Witten boys were always there. They always did it. And then Tony Romo went to his, mm-hmm. went Hawkins yeah, and Rivers so, were yeah. Yeah, Hawkins and my daughter mm-hmm. Giada are, are mm-hmm. the same age, and, and you know it was so fun that they got to do all that together, yeah. and, and and get they get to see their daddies in the Red Salvation yes. Army aprons serving. Yes. And did you go- ever have to wear a hairnet? Did you ever oh, have yeah. to actually? Uh, serve my hair was never it, long enough. You? I did. Yeah, we did both. We'd <laughs> rotate, right? And uh-huh. I was I was the utility player anyway. So, but uh, but yeah, and, and it's that, and it's good for the kids to see because you know they see their their dads on this platform, right, on this uh-huh. huge stage that they get to watch that. But then it, they also get to see you know a dose of okay, look, my dad is also a servant and he gets to give and he gets to give Mm -hmm. himself and his time to make somebody else's day, week, month. I mean, you know, think about the people that get to meet Dak, right? Or they get to meet Jason and like... Yeah, and, then, and, and, and not only do you meet them, but they are literally bringing you your food. Yes. And I mean, they're car- the way it works is the ca- uh, both facilities, yeah. they have little cafeteria yeah. where there's service. But it's Albertsons and Tom yeah. Thumb who are close partners and sponsors with the Cowboys that help provide the food. Essilor, Vision, they are a huge sponsor yeah. of this to help make it possible. But the, the players are back there putting the food on the yeah. plates, on the trays, and then um, the guys are – the other players, the teammates are taking it out. And it's and, and, and to your point, right, like the access, it's not like, okay, hey, we have all the players on one side of the counter and run a line through and say hi as you're going. Like we're bringing the meal out, setting it down, sitting down, taking a knee, talking to these families, hearing about their story. And it's it's just so different than any other opportunity experience. And I love that, that we've had, we have these partnerships with the community to do that because yeah. Yeah. it's so important that, you know, we, we have this platform and what do we choose to do with it, right? Are we going to do it and keep it all for ourselves? And then when you're done, which it's going to be done for everyone, what do you have? Or are you going to actually impact people along the way? And this is a great opportunity to do so. And your wife, Tiffany, all yeah. that she's done for all the years, and she still does a still lot does, with yeah. uh, uh, Michelle Witten and, yeah. and uh, the Dallas Cowboys Women's Association. So this is just one example. But they're doing stuff throughout the year yeah, as well. Yeah, all the time. All the mm-hmm. time. And it's fun to watch that and, and how much they uh, they all do. And, and, you know, really, like the wives are the backbone of this team. And they don't get enough credit because the amount of weight that they have to carry uh, through the season when their husbands are all all in on football, right, and spend 12-plus hours a day focused on this job and then away and then the weight that they carry and then still to go give back to the community and outside of the yeah. family. Like it's enough to just juggle everything that they've got to carry at home. Uh, but it really is cool and, and you know, led by Michelle and yeah. um, and coaches' wives. And coaches' as well. wives, Brill, Brill, Garrett, Brill is Barbara Marinelli. Love it, and that's mm-hmm. what's so that's what's so fun, and that's what's different about this organization. And, and for those Cowboys fans out there that you know, okay, hey, we are you know America's team, but we're America's team for a reason because, and, and really, to be honest with you, from out, outsiders' perspective, the Cowboys are like. Okay, Hollywood and branding and all these things, but that's not what this organization is. This organization is a family and a community, and we invest in the community, and that's what's so cool and different from other organizations. I never saw this anywhere else. As much as the wives do, the players do, the organization does. I mean, you see Charlotte out there giving meals. Absolutely. I mean, and she's the first national female. She's the first female national chairman yeah. for the Salvation Army. Yes. So it's not just oh, let's put on a little halftime yeah. show on Thanksgiving yeah. and yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll have, 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 have Megan Trainer come yeah. out and do a yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. No, you she's know. getting out yeah, there, rolling absolutely. up her sleeves and getting dirty in the community, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. Well, we invite uh, all of Cowboys Nation to you know look on social media. It'll be up beginning uh, Tuesday afternoon if you want to see the guys in the red aprons. But it'll give you a glimpse of behind the scenes, all of the great things that happen, not just around the holidays, but there's so much around um, that make – Cowboys Nation proud uh, to be fans of this organization. So, Tyler, yes. thank you very much. Kyle, thank you very much. Brad Sham will be back next week. We thank all of you for joining us today on Radio Heads. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!